So then after their loss on Thursday, the Mavs, they have now lost to each of the three worst teams in the NBA this season. The Magic, the Rockets, the Pistons are the only team to lose to those three this season. So bringing in NBA champion Kendrick Perkins, senior NBA writer Zach Lowe and Brian Windhorst, it, it feels like the story of the Mavs season. It, it's kind of been pretty simple. Luka goes insane. He's able to drag Dallas to a win or he's not. But if he doesn't get enough help from his supporting cast to emerge victorious, then we know what happens. So, so Brian, how can the Mavs fix this? Yeah, so Malika, they've been a strange home road team. At home, they're 9-3. and three. That's the kind of team that won 52 games last year. On the road, they're 1-8. and eight. And their margin for error gets really, really narrow, and they rely a lot on Luka. Uh, primarily, their defense fails. I know we're going to watch their offense and say, boy, they don't have Jalen Brunson, and that hurts from a playmaker standpoint. And that's absolutely true. Not having a secondary playmaker lets teams like the, Dallas, uh, the Detroit Pistons double Luka like we saw them do last night. But their defense, their bottom five in road defense, their top ten in home defense. So this is a team that doesn't travel well and doesn't have as big of a margin for error and has to rely so much on their star without as much talent this year. Zach, nice shirt, by the way. Yeah, they missed Jalen. They missed Jalen Brunson. They didn't really replace Jalen Brunson. And the thing that would worry me about the Mavericks, to Brian's point, last year when they hit that conference finals run, they found lineups that had a nice balance between offense and defense. They didn't really have to sacrifice at either end of the floor to get that right balance. Now it feels like they're kind of off kilter. Oh, gosh, we need to get more offense on the floor. Oh, that hurts our defense. Okay, let's try and tighten up our defense. Oh, we don't have enough ball handlers and shot makers. They're just a little bit off kilter. Everything will look better once their supporting cast starts making more shots, and that almost has to happen considering how cold they've been. But they just feel like they're one guy short again and kind of in a holding pattern until they find the right team around Luka Doncic again. So I guess that begs the question then, Perk, what is the Mavs, Mavs ceiling as currently constructed? How much time do I have to dive in, <laughs> dive in on the Mavs and Luca right now? I'm just asking. How much time do I have right now? Because I got a lot to say. All the time in the say. world, Perk. One, we keep saying, okay, cool. Well, we keep talking about, okay, he needs help. And the Mavs, now we realize that they took Jalen Bronson for granted. And, and all of a sudden, they didn't really need him. They got Luca, And then they took Przingis for granted. We see what he's doing with the Washington Wizards right now. Okay, so here's the thing. What's next, right? What's next is, is that can we see the Mavs front office or can we hold the Mavs front office accountable and say, hey, Luca does need a, a, a Robin. He does need a certified two. And here's another thing. I want an apology, okay? I don't care. I know Richard Jefferson is probably somewhere watching this right now, but he has been on my tail for the last couple of days about me not having Luca in my top five MVP conversation. And here it is. You go down to, to Detroit without Kay Cunningham, and you lose this game last night. See, here's the problem. I'm not hating on Luca. I think he's an unbelievable talent. He's an awesome talent. He's a showbox. He's everything and more. But when we talk about the MVP conversation, your record can't be 10 and 11. You can't be sitting at the number 11 spot in the Western Conference. And so now we're looking at it, and I just want to know. I want to ask the panel this. I want to take over for a minute, Malika. All you. What is the love affair that everyone has with uh, Luca, because we don't keep the same energy when it comes down to guys like Trey Young last year who averaged 29 and 9. We wasn't pumping them up to win the MVP. What is the love affair that the world has with Luka Doncic that we just want to put him in the MVP conversation or want him to win the MVP? I'm just trying to figure it out. Zach, I'll let you take this one. Well, he's a little bit of a better player than Trey Young, if we're being honest. Bigger, more positionally flexible, probably a slightly better passer, and certainly a better playoff player. But, Perk, I actually would disagree. Last year, all we heard for the first few months of the season is Luka's out of shape. Luka needs to lose weight. Luka's off-court stuff needs to get better. Like, I feel like he was held accountable, and when you overcome that and make the conference finals in the, in the Western Conference, you do to, you get a certain leeway. But I, I don't think that there's been sort of kid gloves around Luka at all. 
while people have hit him for complaining to the referees. I know I have. So I think there's been a fair level of scrutiny there. But to Perk's point, those two guys will always be linked because of that draft mm. day trade. So Perk, just to be very clear here when we're talking about the Mavs, we chatted a little bit about this on our pre-show call. Do you see them as a playoff team, a play-in team, the way that they're presently constructed? I see him. I see him right now as a play-in team. I mean, just just think right now without him having a certified number two, a guy that could go get it on his own like a Jalen Bronson. I don't see them cracking the top six. Like I see them having to be in the play-in tournament, having to fight their way to get into the playoffs as hmm. currently constructed. Unless the Dallas Mavericks make some moves, this team would not be in the playoffs. They would be in the play-in tournament. Hmm. Period. Okay, interesting. You mentioned it. The Mavs are now 11th in the West, just outside of that play-in range, but the West is super close. They're just a game and a half behind the Kings for the sixth seed, which would mean an automatic playoff spot. So to help us contextualize this more and for more on the Mavs, we bring in our senior NBA insider, Adrian Wojnarowski. That was a little bit of a hot take there from Perk, that the Mavs will miss the playoffs if they don't make a move to help Luka. But let's be realistic. What moves are out there for them to make? And Malika, they're limited in the assets they have in Dallas to do something significant. It's very rare that a that a, a contending team like Dallas just allows a player like Jalen Brunson to walk out the door in free agency. There's a couple reasons. Jalen Brunson would have taken uh, during last season. He was eligible for a $56 million extension. Dallas didn't want to offer it till after the trade deadline in case they had to include Brunson in a big deal to go out and get, uh, you know, maybe a, a higher level number two player for him. But that deal really wasn't out there. And by the time they got back to Brunson, he was ready to head into free agency. They lost him for nothing. They misjudged the market on Jalen Brunson. And for an organization like Dallas that historically and certainly even more recently has not drafted very well. They have gone out in free agency and overpaid people like Wes Matthews or, or Chandler Parsons. They've missed big free agents. You know, you've got to be able to keep a player like Jalen Brunson, even if you're going to use him as a trade asset. And, you know, you look at like a team like Milwaukee several years ago when they went and got Drew Holiday. They were looking for their that third star to try to win a title with. Uh, and they gassed a lot of their assets to do it. Dallas is in a position right now. They don't really have a second best player. Mm. And so the deals they can do, I think they're going to be marginal. They're going to be maybe some slight upgrades, but it's going to include more draft picks. They still owe the Knicks on Chris Stapp's Porzingis, and they thought Porzingis was going to be that uh, sidekick uh, for uh, Luka Doncic. It didn't work, and now they've got uh, Bertans, uh, Spencer Didwitty to show for that original deal. Uh, that, that's not enough. So you, you look at the team building in Dallas, and listen, a player like Luka Doncic, the clock is always running for an organization. And if all of a sudden you end up in the play-in this year, you, you lose in the first round next year, and you're getting further deeper into his contract, and you don't have a supporting cast, you worry about being able to keep that player. And so mm. all those things are in play for Dallas right now. Well, and speaking of Jalen Brunson, the Dallas Mavericks, they take on the Knicks. That game is tomorrow. Let's go to tonight's game. Yesterday, Woj, you broke the news that Chris Middleton is planning to return tonight versus the Lakers on ESPN. What is the Bucks' plan for him here? Yeah, listen, getting uh, Chris Middleton back in the lineup 20 games into the season, you know, this is for a team that really uh, at 15 and 5 played extremely well without him. And now they get to see where they are with Boston in the Eastern Conference. I think Milwaukee, Boston have separated themselves uh, early in this season from the rest of the East. And I think now for Milwaukee, for John Horst, their GM, and Mike Budenholzer, Get a look at what this roster looks like, what this team looks like, and, and what needs they might want to still fill, uh, very likely on their bench uh, between now and the trade deadline. But uh, obviously, remember last year, uh, Milwaukee was without Chris Middleton in that conference semifinal with Boston, lost in seven games. And certainly the idea of a full-strength Milwaukee-Boston team, uh, those teams here uh, headed uh, into the playoffs is – uh, it, it feels like an, an inevitable um, a rematch, this time probably in the conference final. Well, the Bucks are certainly happy to be getting Chris Middleton back. I want to bring Zach back into this conversation because you've essentially said, Zach, wake me up when the Bucks are healthy to see what their offense looks like. They're getting another piece back in Middleton. What does he open up for the Bucks' offense here? 
Yeah, and, and wake me up, they're 15-5, and five, so they've done pretty darn well without the most important ball handler and maybe crunch time shot maker on their team. And that's what Chris Middleton is. The Bucks became a championship-level team when Giannis embraced a role as a screener and a diver on the pick and roll. It's a rare sacrifice for someone of his stature who came up in fame as Point Giannis, as the guy who wanted to handle the ball and take jump shots. He still does a lot of that, but when he became a pick and roll screener like this, with his diving ability, his dunking ability, he reached a whole different level and so did the Bucks. And I don't think he makes that transition if they don't have a ball handler on Chris Middleton's level. A pull-up jump shooter, a good passer, a good tough shot maker, a ball handler that Giannis trusts to hand that part of the offense to for big chunks of the game. It's a big sacrifice for Giannis. Sacrifice may be the wrong word, but it's an unusual kind of role for a superstar of his status. Hmm. And I don't know that he makes it without Middleton and I don't know that they ever win the title if he doesn't make that sacrifice. Chris Middleton is the most important ball handler on the Milwaukee Bucks and think about it they're 15 and 5 without that player so I agree with Woj it's them in Boston right now and they get a big part of their identity back tonight. Chris Middleton the most important ball handler on the Milwaukee Bucks the Bucks and the Lakers they tip off at 7 30 Eastern but Chris Middleton is not the only one making his return tonight still to come. Jimmy Butler will make his return to Boston tonight after missing the last seven games. We